Hey guys, can you hear me well? All right, so um, I'm Vadim. Uh, I lead the design and UX group at Canada Post. I'm, you can have questions why we have design and UX at Canada Post, but that will be later. <laughs> so let's start about, I think there's a big question, you know, data. I, I'm actually really happy to see so many people here, but data informed design. I have a question for you. Do you think that data actually stifle creativity? How many think that it does? Oh wow, awesome. <laughs> Amazing. Um, bonus points for why I think there's a the cliche of gray over there. We heard about 41 shade of blue. <clears throat> so that's not so long ago, that's less than 10 years ago. Uh, and this is Google, which is today actually considered I would say they are leading a lot of design, a really good design initiatives. But less than 10 years ago, you can see those quotes. Marisa Mayer solves designs with data. Google could design with endless testing. But the fact is, they were actually doing a lot of, so the design from Google's perspective was testing that and essentially AP testing every small feature. So this is a quote from, uh, from a guy named, um, sorry, like his last name is Bowden. He was one of the first visual design leads at Google, and when he left, he wrote that. And yes, it's true that the team at Google can decide between two blues, so they're testing 41 shades of blue. Uh, and they essentially came to A-B testing because they couldn't decide which one to go with. it. Now, you know, there's nothing wrong with testing, and we'll be talk talking more about testing your design assumption with data. The problem becomes when you rely too much on that testing. So essentially, uh, and I actually really like that we call it data-informed design because another term is data-driven design. In a data-driven design, you really do a lot of validation on every small bit of your design decision. Now, there are organizations that do it a lot. One, another example would be Amazon. Amazon tests a lot of small things, and you know they, they really test. Uh, the, you know, there's a lot of good content about how they test every small feature whether it comes to registration or checkout, and you can understand that you're talking about billions of dollars, uh, but when you really testing that shit out of your design, it's, it can become uh, a Frankenstein if you're testing every single feature and every small piece of design. So, it doesn't have to. I mean, yes, in case of Google, when you have the testing 41 shades of design, I guess it does stifle creativity and the, uh, you know, the length of how you, how far can you go with the design, but it doesn't have to. So this is a Venn diagram by Alistair Simpson. Uh, he is one of hand design at Atlassian. Um, and what I love about it is basically if you combine data with empathy, and you also need to have a gut feeling as a designer how to actually act on that on the data and empathy. That's where the great product design comes from. So data gives you the what, empathy gives you an empathy and more, uh, you know, more research and give you the why. Because the data gives you a lot of, you know, a lot of information and a lot of insights in, in what people do with your products. But the empathy really gives you the why. And how to do that, it's up to you. That's where you have, and I think that's, this is a very important quality of good designers, understanding how can you apply your design knowledge and experience and combine the data and empathy to come up with good designs. Another thing, another kind of misconception about data is when people think about data, they automatically think about big data. So big data, huge numbers, uh, and in fact, a lot of organizations have a lot of data. I mean, there's a lot of technology that allows us to, to uh, gather a lot of data around the use of products. So when people think about you know, data and data-driven and data-informed design, they think about those huge numbers. And that's why I find that designers sometimes kind of feel hesitant about using uh, data. The thing is, you also need to think about 
fig data. And fig data, this is a term, uh, I don't know how many, how many of you are familiar with, is basically there, uh, you know, it basically the, the empathy is what you learn about your users, is that's the why. There's a good example about uh, use of, uh, of thick data combined with, uh, with big data from, that comes from, from Nokia uh, um, at the time when they were still popular. And uh, there was a, you know, there was a ethnography researcher working for Nokia in China and she's done a lot of research uh, learning about people actually done a lot of ethnography research. And when she created the report and she sent it out to the headquarters, they pretty much ignored that. They said, well, we have a much, much bigger data that supports, you know, in hundreds of millions of, uh, that does not support what you're saying. And we all know where Nokia is today. And I'm not to say that's the only thing that, that's caused for, obviously, there are many more factors, but this is one of the things that you can't rely just on the big data. You really need to understand the why behind that. So that's the important part. Now, speaking about big numbers, um, I'll skip to the chemicals part. So some numbers about chemicals. So we are 64K, uh, 64,000 employees at Canapos. Uh, Canapos serves uh, obviously all Canadians. So there's 16 million addresses that we serve every day as we deliver essentially to every address of Canada. There's 200 million, so this is data, this is stats for 2016. We deliver to two, uh, 200 million, uh, we have 200 million visits to digital channels. So digital channels, I'm talking about obviously all the websites, all the different digital applications, mobile applications, essentially all the digital touch points we have for our customers. And this is an interesting uh, stat. We have 319 million items tracked on web and mobile. This again, this for this is our, by far, our most frequently and most uh, popular tool track. You all buy things online, and you all want to know when those things come to you. So <laughs> that's where people go to. They go to track. So as you can imagine, we have a lot of streams of data coming to us. Now, how to act on this and what to do with that, this is really up to us. What are the, some of the data sources that we have at Canada Post and how we use them? So um, I hope you're familiar with this diagram, so your behavioral versus digital quantitative versus qual, uh, and these are some of the data sources that we have. Obviously, one that you all familiar with is web and mobile analytics. So we, you know, we track and we know what's what's going on with our in all our digital channels. How people come to us, uh, you know, what are, what's the funnel, you know, how they are successful in uh, in completing the journeys. Uh, we have true intent studies, right? So that's where we're trying to learn a bit more about. So it's not just the numbers, but we to learn what are people coming to uh, for on our digital channels and can they be successful in, uh, in completing their tasks. Um, usability is obviously the, you know, the, that's where you learn a lot about this, uh, about, about the why. So we have obviously usability lab studies where we conduct a lot of um, in-person moderated uh, usability studies. We have usability benchmarking. We do remote user testing. Uh, and there are other things such as car sorting, tree testing. Uh, we have quite a lot of data that comes from, so if you can remember, Canada Post uh, is not a pure digital company. So we see there's a lot of data that comes from offline channels as well such as customer service, our retail network, what are the interactions that we have with the customers, and how can we use this for, uh, you know, for design of products better. Three ways to use data and design. There are many more than three, but I would like to talk about these three. Prove, improve, and discover. Um, so I'll briefly talk about them in general, and then I'll jump into some of the examples that we have uh, you know, with Canada Post. So first of all, prove. You can use data to prove that your design is actually working. Uh, I mean, at a certain point in your, uh, in your organization, you would come across a stakeholder or a client that would ask you, well, okay, it's all fine, but how do you know that this is actually working? So you use data to prove that you are, you know, you can track conversion metrics, you can track uh, different usability scores, 
So essentially, and I hope all of you, when you're designing, you're thinking about KPIs that you are assigning to your designs. You definitely need to be thinking about that because it's not just about designing something, a great experience that is great from your know, interaction design or visual design, and it's, you also need to, to make sure that it's performing well. So in using, uh, using data to prove your design is working, this is one of the great tools that you have designer. This is one of the great tools against hippos. Who knows what hippo is? Not everyone talking about that animal. So, Hippo is the highest paid person in the office or highest paid third person opinion. It basically can be one of the executives and when you have a meeting, it's, it's your, uh, it's basically, it's you against them. So, if you don't have data to back that up, you can, you know, you can argue with them indefinitely. This will not really help you. If you have data, in my experience, this is really where it comes very handy because you can prove, well, the data says so. If they would still disagree with you, this would be up to them just to, you know, <laughs> to take that on that. The other thing is improve. And this is obviously, so uh, that's where I would say we use data at Canada Post uh, most. This is the way that we use to improve the design, right? So we, we're looking into, you know, how our products, our digital products performing. We're tracking different metrics um, and we're looking how how we can use this to improve. I'll have specific examples. Uh, this is definitely something that I think most organizations uh, use that as well uh, to ensure that you track the performance of your design of your digital products and you use it to improve it. And finally, we have Discover. Uh, Discover is probably the most challenging one, but this is definitely very valuable and probably the most valuable for, for startups if you're trying to see based on the data, what are some of the new territories and the new areas that you can develop your product into. So uh, leveraging that and, and, and then also help you to decide you know, which way to go. So, so this is some generic topics. Now I'll just give you some, I'll jump, um, jump to give you some examples. Actually, I'll start from, from the last one, so I could discover. So uh, early this year, we worked on um, on a product. We worked on redesign of one of our digital products, which is a pickup tool. So a pickup is a tool that's used by our business customers uh, to schedule, uh, to basically to set up a pickup for their parcel that they're shipping out to their customers. Uh, the tool is very outdated, and it's you know it's due to redesign. So um, we conducted the design sprint. And one of the things that's the design sprint on the day two, they came across, uh, there's a two main functionalities in that tool. There's a scheduled pickup that can be scheduled, and there's an on-demand pickup. Obviously, the scope of that, if you want to handle that in one design sprint, they couldn't, they couldn't tackle the both. So they needed to decide which way to go. So data, and you can read through the slide, but there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of numbers here, but basically the data shows what is the engagement with this tool and how many customers use one versus the other and what are the alternatives. So that was very easy for them to decide. And option one, they decided to go with on demand and they continued on the path basically. So that's where the data helped us to discover which way to go and how to proceed in this case. Another one is improve. And this is a huge one. This is probably, so I've been in Canada for about two years and this is definitely one of the biggest projects that we've been working on and we'll still continue to work for some time. We are improving CanadaPost.ca. Uh, specifically, we're calling website re-architecture. Um, re-architecture, not redesign, because we're really focusing on the on information architecture is what's driving it, but it's the content and it's really how this everything is structured. This is a massive project and it helped us on across all the points to prove, improve, and discover uh, but there was a lot of, you know, a lot of things that we, we did. Obviously, so we did collect a lot of stats about the use from web analytics. Uh, we ran multiple rounds of user testing. Uh, we conducted interviews both with stakeholders, with users, uh, across multiple audiences. Uh, we did a lot of car sorting and tree testing to validate, to basically come up with a new structure of, uh, of the site as well as to validate that, to that it's working. Um, so, so far, yeah, that gets multiple rounds of every uh, of every of those activities. And it will be, you know, it's ongoing and we're still working on that. And then pro uh, finally, proof or improve, right? So that's what you really try. So and this is an example of the true intent studies and we have those running on a few of our channels and products. 
Uh, in our case, we actually combine it with a super queue. So super queue is one of their methods. And don't ask me about what it stands for. Does that? But if you really want to know, go to measuring you. The guy who came up with a super queue methodology is Jeff Soro. Uh, and this is basically allow us to measure the overall experience on the, on our web channels. So we capturing with the two intent studies. We obviously capturing what people can they you know we capturing some data additional um, about their users. We asking them can they successfully complete what they came to the website to do, and we also capturing some some uh, you know some stats about their experience on the website. So it's really about learning who are your users, what is the goal on the website, are they successful in completing the task? These are the main things you want to learn. And on the way, you would also ask them what do they think about their experience, right? So that's where you have the super queue come in, uh, and then we track that uh, for all of web channels. We using super queue for our overall web experience, and we're also using SUS metric for measuring our specific product when we uh, when we measure the usability for of our products. So, just to sum it up, I think I'm good on time. Use data from various sources, right? When you think about data, you really need to think about it, not just about it as a big data, you really need to think about the quant and the qual and combine it. Add context to your numbers. So, and I think that's where it's important when you're presenting the data, present the what and the why together. So, to whoever you're presenting it to, they can understand the whole picture and not just some, some specific stats. Use data to measure your design and track progress and changes. Um, we should always, you know, as designers, we should really care about that. We should, we should track our designs. We should see and we should care about how our designs perform. It's not just about designing great experience or great interface. It's really understanding how it's performing. Can it, you know, does it achieve the business goals? Can the users completely uh, satisfied with that? So, uh, basically track your design. Craft a meaningful story using data. When you're presenting that, make sure that you present it in a way that people can understand and not just dry reports, you know, with, with some numbers and tables. Um, I think, you know, as designers, it's, it's our role to make sure, again, it, it really ties into the app context of your numbers, but it's really connecting the two together. Share and discuss data in your organization. Don't be afraid to connect with people even if you don't have data scientists or you know, data analysts working close to you. Don't be afraid to go to them. If you don't understand how can you, or even don't, don't know what data sources you have uh, you know, for, and your, for your products and organization, don't be afraid to go and ask them. Uh, so really you know, become friends with them. In our case, for example, our, uh, our data and analytics team is, uh, you know, is part of the digital group, but it's not part of the design team. Uh, but we do work, work very closely with them just to you know to see you know what data you do need from them and it, it's it's a mutual relationship. You need to feed into them and you need to get information from them. And then finally and most importantly, you need to remember data is your friend, not foe. Uh, don't be afraid of it. I think you know it's great, I think that you guys are afraid of it based on your in the first question. Um, good product design comes from striking the right balance between data, empathy, and design intuition. Thank you. Any questions? I think we have a couple minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, how do you use data to prioritize design? To prioritize design? This is a really great question. Um, so we use data, one of the things that we use, we, uh, we have um, what we call our consumer tools, which are one of our most frequently used tools. So I mentioned track, we have others. We constantly track the performance on those, and we track the performance in terms of the numbers, like the raw numbers, how many people use that. We, wrote, uh, we track the usability scores using the super queue, how they're successful, and then, uh, and then just to see which one we actually need to put more, you know, more focus on. So from time to time, we can go back and we see you know, what's not working. Uh, sometimes it's not necessarily the, the design that's working, that there are, many, that there are other things. Uh, but you know, we've used it already twice to actually prioritize our work in design stream and prioritize the design of certain tool over another. Thing, right? So depending on how it performs and how well or bad it performs, that's how we prioritize that. Did you encounter any challenges introducing a data-orientated, data-informed design practice at Canada Post? And if so, how did you tackle them? 
So, you know, to be honest with you, we didn't formally introduce well. From now on, we, I mean, it's it's a progress, and I think uh, using data in your design, in your design organization, and within a big organization, it's a gradual process. I, I believe it strongly depends on the maturity, on the overall UX or design maturity of organization, and also on the maturity of the team. So obviously, if you're just starting to build a team that doesn't have anything, you don't have any processes, any practices, you know, kind of have, uh, I think it would be probably a bit hard to come in a well, less time we should use data for design. But as the team start, you know, mature and grow, uh, you reach a certain point when you feel that it's, you know, this would be a good time to actually think about more stuff, right? So we really took it step by step. I mean, like, we've, uh, we've established a research practice. I mean, as you, you could see, there's a lot of the data that comes from the research practice. If you don't have research practice, you're just relying on the big data, which is, again, just so. So I think it's, it depends on the timing, and just you kind of need to feel where, you know, what's the right time for your organization and design team. Any other post offices in the world that you think are doing a good job, like Canada Post, in data and design? Uh, so I don't know if you're doing specifically a good job with data and design. Uh, but yeah, definitely, Australia Post is doing some great stuff in the overall experience, you know, they're really looking into the overall experience they provide. Uh, you have New Zealand Post, actually one of the interesting one, um, and again, I don't know if they're using data and design, but the Iceland Post. So you wouldn't think, but Iceland Post has a really great, amazing experience online. So, yeah, these are the Is there any uh, needed translation or tension between design-focused professionals working with the data-focused professionals. Is there any extra steps or translation, or is it generally smooth according to the data-focused people and the design-focused personnel? It's a great it's question. I think in all cases, actually, and when we started, we started hearing some, um, there was definitely disconnects between, between the design team and the data team. And the funny thing, they, the data team actually wanted to connect with us. They really wanted to understand our process and our priorities much, much earlier. Um, and then so, you know, we initiated that, that process so we actually connect with them. Again, I think it really depends on organization, but it's, that's why I say don't be afraid to reach out. I think in most cases they will be happy to share that information and to work with you to establish that. So just to add to that, you know, Canada Post, we, I think we're in a pretty good position, but we're definitely not there, and I wouldn't call us, you know, completely data informative. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of other data sources we can use, and we, we're constantly looking how can we bring that into our practice. Uh, and it's, it's a collaborative work with, you know, with our data folks and product management, so that's... Last question. Okay, so... <laughs> I don't know who was first. Who first? Okay. <laughs> yes. What's your end goal? What's your finish line? Finish line? For you mean for what? For, for implementing for the data? approach, you're implementing the new designs. Do you even have an end goal? You mean for implementing data into the design process or for overall the evolution of design? Driven by the data for Canada Post. I don't think there's and so so one thing about, about data, it's um, using data in your design is really a mindset. It's not just you know have a kind of start and end goal, right? So it's really changing the mindset of people working. So designers, uh, product managers, obviously the data scientists or data analysts, um, and how to work together. I think there's no end goal. I mean that's obviously you know you reach a certain point where you feel that it's the process is working well. Uh, it, but you know, as we you, more data becomes available, and we know, like in today's world, there's there's many more sources of being added pretty much every day, right? So how can you introduce that? Uh, I'll give another example. Like one of the examples that this could be potential source of data. We we have a pilot where we have um, digital experience uh, combined with a physical experience. So basically, tracking users uh, user interactions within a retail source. That's a potential data source that can come in into you know into our world later. We're not tracking or doing it with anything now, uh, but yeah, it's it's an evolution. A big round of applause.